Good afternoon. You are back with the Vermont House Government Operations Committee. Um, we are continuing our conversation around, um, at this point, pensions governance. And I understand there have been some conversations going on uh, with some folks uh, trying to put a, uh, another proposal on the table um, for how we might strengthen the way we govern our public pension system. Um, uh, just not to, not to uh, belabor a point, but <laughs> there have been some misperceptions as to who is involved in that process. And, um, and uh, the only role the legislature really has is to um, pass the law directing the folks who are, uh, who are to be governing um, board members of this system. And so we have a few of those folks here with us today. And um, so we look forward to hearing from Tom Galanka and Beth Pierce with uh, a proposal on governance changes. Well, thank you. And thank you, Madam Chair. I wanna uh, thank you for, for hearing from us at this committee. You know, Beth and I are uniquely uh, implicated in governance. Obviously we're directly involved with the governance of VPIC as well as the underlying boards. We have interaction with a lot of interested groups, whether it's the unions, whether it's um, uh, the board members, whether it's committee members, whether it's the legislature. And I think, you know, Beth and I provide a unique perspective, which I thought would be helpful here, particularly at this process. You know, um, I do want to state from the start that I'm not representing VPIC. VPIC has not had a meeting to discuss the proposal. I have reached out to all VPIC members and I have discussed with them, obviously, the original government, government ops proposal. And I have reached out um, yesterday to discuss, uh, Beth, and my concerns and questions and, and proposals. So I have a general feel for the VPIC committee, but I don't want to speak for them in this, uh, this venue. I think it's just uh, not appropriate at this point. I think I will say that VPIC's preference would be to utilize their government's uh, study that they've commissioned. Um, the RFP for that government study went out early this week, and we do expect um, uh, submissions for that by next Friday. So we will have more to share with you on that. And Eric could, could fill in more information on that RFP process, but that, that will be coming next week. So I wanna start by saying thank you and thank Beth for her participation in this. I know um, it, it's, been a, it's been a long couple of weeks. I know you're probably getting sick of uh, hearing from me. Um, but I'll, I'll be brief. I don't want to read the proposal directly, but I'll, I'll, I'll highlight the, you know, the high points that I think it, it, it addresses. Um, you know, in my email, I list sort of the four fundamental ideas that I think are important for this board and this body to con con consider. Um, VPIC continuity, representation equality, transparency, transparency and a pathway to independence for VPIC, because I believe as we grow the assets, um, it's much it's much more important to address uh, professionalism as well as to be able to uh, attract staff that, that will come to the Green Mountain State and help uh, Eric and his team you know, manage these funds. Um, going into the proposed amendments that Beth and I put forward, um, they're basically broken down into four buckets. And I think for simplicity's sake, I'll break them, I'll, I'll list what I view as uh, um, where, they're, where they lie. Number one through nine are really structure and equity um, that we think would help really combine and, and uh, bridge the current VPIC with a potential change to VPIC going forward. You know, specific proposals in this are just that, they're proposals. Um, uh, Beth and I feel that they would work very well with, um, with how we see the board's work right now but we're open for discussion in regards to specific alterations or changes to any of these that are listed. Um, items 10, 11, and 12, I would list as process items. And those would be ones that we came up with due to our current recent interaction with the legislature. You know, these would affect who's responsible for the rate of return assumption, um, who would have, uh, we would require onboarding and training and that the actuary would complete the experience studies um, within three years instead of five. So those are more process oriented. Items 13 and 14 are more on transparency. And I think these are items that have come about through our discussion with Jim Voitko. And in particular, Jim wrote item 13 because we wanted um, best practice 
listed into the um, record that would show what, what, what we think a committee such as yours should ask an investment committee of this nature in, uh, in proper good governance. So that would be directly from Jim and uh, we'll be happy to answer questions on that as well. And then the last piece, which would be the final uh, last two, 15 and 16, would be more related to transition. And I think Beth and I are in agreement that um, a pathway to transition maintains continuity. It protects the trust. Um, I think it also gives uh, uh, credence to the hard work that the current members have given by offering uh, uh, current positions uh, into the current new board until their term ends. And so the new transition process would be linked to their existing term positions. Um, with that, I'll throw it over to Beth if she has any other comments. I don't wanna go into specifics until we have questions answers, but I'd be happy to answer any questions as well. Committee, any questions for Tom before we invite Beth to share her observations and thoughts on this? All right, Beth, thank you for being with us again. Let's, let's get you unmuted. There Can we you go. hear me now? Yes. There we go. Okay. Uh, I think that's been in several commercials, but uh, we'll go from there. Uh, well, thank you very much. Uh, for the record, Beth Pierce, the state treasurer, and uh, uh, I want to follow up on some of uh, Tom's comments, and I think that uh, we're at a crossroads with VPIC. Uh, we've been looking at this issue for some time, and there have been comments. Um, uh, Representative Hooper, I remember you bringing this up uh, several months ago in terms of uh, the independence of, uh, of VPIC, uh, and when we first created VPIC back in uh, 2005, I believe, when the legislature, let me rephrase, when, when you folks created VPIC, um, and it was a very large committee, 17 members. It was a committee of the whole. Uh, there was some discussion about who should be on, who shouldn't be on, and uh, um, it was a, a very tough process. Um, so we ended up with a rather unwieldy um, uh, committee, uh, of, of, as I said, a committee of the whole. Uh, we then hired a consultant to take a look at this back in, I believe, 2007, that area. And uh, one of the recommendations was to, um, to, to uh, reduce the members to a manageable level, um, to create a, um, uh, an independent chair, which is Tom Galanka, uh, and he's elected by uh, the six other members. So we went from uh, 17 to seven, um, six actual members, and then one who's elected by the board, and, uh, uh, or the VPIC, excuse me, and uh, serves as the chair. And um, um, uh, uh, he, um, in, in this case, um, has um, uh, responsibility um, for, to report to the board. So he is, in fact, um, essentially an employee of the board, even though he, um, uh, the cost center is in our office uh, for appropriation purposes. Uh, the board, uh, uh, Tom is not a, um, a uh, voting member, um, except in the case of a tie. Um, I am on the, um, on the um, uh, committee as well. I apologize, I keep going back between board and committee. The correct term is committee. And uh, uh, so I'm one of the six members that, um, that uh, generally votes. Uh, we have uh, three um, uh, uh, members who are um, uh, representatives of their, um, their particular um, um, uh, uh, board uh, and they're selected by the, um, the, the trustees. So we have three employee members and then we have um, uh, two that are appointed by the governor. Um, it's worked fairly well. I would say that um, it, it's, it's um, um, I always use the term lean, but not mean. Uh, they work very closely together. It's a group and folks that have been on there, the employee members have had a lot of longevity. Um, they've been there for years and they've learned a great deal in the process. They've taken educational training. I recently sent you folks a copy of our education policy, which is part of our, um, um, our policies that are available on, on our website. Uh, it's time to take another look at it. Um, at the time we set this up in 2007, uh, um, uh, seven, eight, that period, uh, we had about um, under $3 billion of assets, probably closer to two, uh, something in that 2.5 range. And, uh, um, and I hope I said billion, not million. And uh, that, um, that didn't create um, a lot of room for, for um, 
uh, moving things over there, economies of scale. Um, and uh, uh, at the time, um, uh, my predecessor and the General Assembly thought that um, uh, that uh, the expenses um, should stay with the uh, Treasurer's office. So our office, um, while I have one vote, is responsible uh, to, um, for uh, maintaining the staff, so the CIO. Um, and we've had, as I said, two very good ones over the last uh, 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 several years, um, uh, Eric Henry and Matt Considine. Uh, Eric has uh, uh, been a great um, value to us as we've moved forward. Uh, so they're in our office as well as two other staff um, that um, that uh, report uh, to Eric. Uh, and uh, that's a kind of on the small side. So we, we relied very heavily on our consultant in the past by bringing on uh, Eric and, and, and prior to that, Matt, we've had a, an ability to um, to play devil's advocate, so to speak, with the um, with the consultant uh, that we've hired an independent consultant. They do not manage monies. They act as a fiduciary with our plan and to have uh, more give and take. So we've added that uh, a, a position going forward. I usually say to the General Assembly when I'm in appropriations or in your 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 uh, your department or your, your committee that I think that we should have at least one person per, per billion and uh, we're not there. Um, and uh, I um, think that this provides us an opportunity to to look now that we were at that five billion dollar range to um, to um, have a have a different um, um, composition, have a different reporting structure, and it's time to do that. Uh, now, I will point out that uh, that other states, this 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 uh, particular piece would be in the minority compared to other states, this particular structure, but it's also one that's dem demonstrated effectiveness in some very good plans. And I would point out um, SWIB, uh, the acronym there, the, um, uh, this, uh, the uh, uh, Wisconsin State uh, or the State of Wisconsin Investment Board, I'll get that right, and uh, PRIM, the Massachusetts Pension uh, Reserve in, uh, Investment Management uh, um, Board. And uh, in those cases, I, I worked very closely with PRIM when I was um, uh, a deputy in Massachusetts and, and had the good sense to come to Vermont. And uh, they, um, they operated as a separate legal entity. Uh, they um, um, hired their own staff. Uh, I worked with them uh, as, as a deputy in charge of cash management and investments on a monthly basis to take a look at their cash flows, what do they need, and put that aside. Uh, but uh, essentially, um, they, they were their own entity. There are part, they are part of the state's financial statements because they are um, um, substantially uh, part of their, uh, their financial mix. But they, 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 they are their own um, board and staff, and I think that's the direction we need to go. It's going to take a little time. We want the consultant to work with us to to uh, to make that happen, and uh, I think it's the right move. And it's it's time to do that. Um, we we looked at that back, as I said, several years ago, and didn't see the cost numbers working. I think they do now, and uh, it's it's time to take that step. The other piece I would talk to is about transparency. And if you take a look at number fourteen, I believe I'm going to go down there on my uh, my email here, uh, or my my word document. And if you take a look at that uh, to develop, uh, or 13, to develop a report on one, three, five, and seven year, 10 year performance um, uh, versus peer benchmark. We already have that. It is on our webpage, um, but I, I, I would agree that um, our webpage is a little cumbersome. And uh, it's all there with the exception of the fee report and um, uh, the uh, recommendation by this committee. And we are going to do that immediately and put the fee reports up there. Um, but um, it's out there, it's cumbersome, and the thought process was to um, provide that to each beneficiary. Now, how you do that, we have 50 to 60,000 um, 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 members, um, uh, active and retired invested members of the system. So um, how we communicate that to them, I'd like to see some type of dashboard uh, and then links to, uh, to, uh, to more detailed report for those that are interested. We do send out an annual statement. Actually, we do it electronically now. Uh, we used to send out paper statements to everyone. Uh, we do that electronically. Um, maybe there's a way to put a, a link to that in there. Maybe there's a, a, a separate uh, notification we send, but we wanna take a look and work with our consultant to find the best way to provide that information to all 60,000 um, uh, folks that, um, that have a stake in this system. Uh, so I think the transparency issue, uh, well, again, while we've had the information out there, this will be an opportunity to um, uh, uh, fine tune it make it uh, more streamlined, make it more accessible. And I, I, I commend the committee for, um, uh, for bringing up those issues as, as we work through it. Um, if you see at the end, uh, we did talk about trans, uh, transitional um, 
uh, rules and uh, I think we need to have some institutional knowledge as you move forward. Um, just uh, saying we're going to take uh, changes today and uh, all um, uh, current members would leave. You would not have the institutional knowledge that you need um, to move forward. And so I think that uh, this uh, this is a um, uh, 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 very streamlined, efficient, um, effective and, and getting back to um, to um, uh, Tom's points in terms of transparency, a path to independence uh, uh, represents a, a, um, a, um, um, a uh, equity in terms of membership. Uh, as I said, the uh, the employee uh, groups through the, the boards would have three appointees. The governor would have two plus this, the um, the statutory uh, commissioner of finance. Uh, and uh, as we move forward, uh, last uh, piece that I'll say that is that. Uh, um, that uh, we really want to rely on that consultant. Uh, we are in the process of doing that. We had um, been uh, talking about this and we actually um, uh, put together um, a, um, uh, uh, a thought process on hiring a consultant uh, before this, um, before our testimony. And I believe that um, um, we can get the information on budgetary authority, personnel transfer, hiring, how the compensation is done. And I think that's something that the, um, that the board should, uh, or again, the committee uh, should um, 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 have um, uh, control over. Uh, there are going to be issues about uh, establishing the fund itself, uh, creating a separate um, IRS fund with um, uh, the appropriate um, um, uh, tax, um, uh, tax identification number. So there's a lot to do. We want to talk to the um, consultant about that. Those are more of the operational side, but also the strategic. How does this committee work? How do we how do we make it the efficient and best uh, committee that we can? And again, I think the opportunity exists now and I appreciate the opportunity uh, to present this. And uh, we're looking forward to um, um, legislation because this would require um, um, uh, changes in the statute and working with you to get that done. And thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Rob LeClaire has a question. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and I apologize, my computer seems to be in a little delayed reaction, so I don't know what it's like on that end. Um, good afternoon there, Madam Treasurer. I have a, a question about uh, bullet point three. Okay, let me get there. It's the public members would be subject to financial expert and independence requirements. Yes. One, can you speak to what those either are or would be? And it appears that that requirement would only apply to those three members is that okay, correct so, uh, that um that uh actually three because those two plus the uh the chair uh the chair that uh, would be um uh, elected by the um the committee uh would also uh, be required to be a financial expert uh, and uh, if he or she uh, were incapacitated for any reason, um, we would um, look to um, to select an additional um, uh, a, um, a financial expert to be that interim chair. So there's some definition um, um, uh, down below, you know, material um, expertise and experience in institutional money management, uh, significant pension or, um, or relevant um, uh, uh, expertise. Uh, uh, taking a look at some certified uh, certifications. Uh, we can fine tune this a bit, but I think what we're trying to get at is that uh, we want folks that have professional experience in, in, in the investment world. And I think that that's important. And, uh, it, um, uh, and uh, I think that the chair, uh, I believe very strongly that the chair should have those experiences. That said, there's been a lot of testimony and a lot of data and, and, and um, uh, 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 articles and professional um, opinions that uh, there should be employee representation on the board and uh, that uh, there's a BC study that you saw. I was looking very closely at a, a study done in Maryland. Uh, there were two studies, one done by a professional consultant uh, that uh, similar to the type of consultant that we're looking to, um, to, um, to uh, hire. Um, and uh, also a report by a legislative committee following that. So they're, they're pretty current. Uh, one is at um, uh, uh, 2018 and the legislative report, I believe, is in 2019. Uh, and they had some similar comments. They, um, they uh, said their board was 15 and they said it was too large and unwieldy. Um, they uh, uh, looked at one in the nine to 10 range um, and they pointed out that their board was a uh, combination of benefits and investments and with a sub investment committee, a little like the New Hampshire model, which we believe is a little too unwieldy and creates a, a two tiered process to, uh, to get things done. 
um, particularly if you need to uh, move quickly to um, to transition um, um, assets from a manager that uh, uh, has some we have some concerns about. But I'll read the um, in the report. It said trustees express numerous concerns about the size of, of the investment committee as being too big and too unwieldy. And there was also a, a recommendation citing the BC report, but citing others that uh, you need to have between 20 and 70 percent of active and retired members on the um, on the committee. Um, our members are have an educational policy associated with them that they need to um, to take um, uh, educational training over the years. Um, I, I know that Jeff testified yesterday, and he is a um, uh, a certified fiduciary. Uh, and folks take a robust um, um, educational training um, um, opportunities. They take advantage of those opportunities. And we do report on that. I know there was a comment where the only report on, uh, on attendance. The reason we have that is for the boards and for the governor to know that he um, uh, or she, um, the, that the members are participating and participating in training. And I think that that's just to make sure that uh, those members are, are committed. The other investment reports that you've um, um, asked about uh, with the exception of the fee, the performance numbers, uh, the financial statements, the, um, um, uh, the, um, uh, the policies, they're all available on our website. But as I said, we, we are looking to make that a little more streamlined and create a dashboard. So I think having that membership is important because they have skin in the game and they and they need uh, and we need to have their their um, their perspective in it and they need training um, uh, the folks we have on there right now are very um, um, they've, they've been there for years and uh, as I said in previous testimony I'll pick on uh, one of the committee members Joe Mackey I don't know if Joe is listening to this he's been on the committee for a very long period of time and if you ask him about various asset classes if you ask him about uh, uh, style um, with managers, he would have the um, the institutional knowledge um, to to be able to opine on that. Uh, we we see that um, uh, that their 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 voice is important, and we see an opportunity for uh, the type of uh, training and educational experience that would support that. So I would say that the board um, is with the two members from the governor, the um, the experience that uh, we currently have uh, with uh, with Tom, and the knowledge of those, uh, those um, 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 representatives of the system um, is, is extraordinary. Um, and uh, I, I commend them for their, their commitment to this. I know I went on, uh, Representative LeClaire, I think I answered your question, um, but um, I certainly um, um, would follow up and I apologize for getting in the weeds a little bit. Rob, okay, with a follow up. Treasurer, um, you, you did answer my question and then some, thank you, Madam Treasurer. Okay. Um, I'm trying to scan through this and, and listen attentively to what you're saying. I'm in this, does, there's there anywhere in this that VPIC would have any either oversight or input into the benefit side of the um, The answer to that is no. Um, we think that the benefit side um, uh, needs experts as well. And when you're taking a look, um, um, an investment expert is not likely to have um, uh, the same experience in making uh, determinations from the medical review board on disability uh, applications. Uh, taking a look at uh, uh, some of the, um, uh, the actuarial side that's related to, um, um, to mortality, related to, um, uh, to uh, uh, turnover, related to salaries. I think that, um, uh, that uh, while well, um, uh, the, um, the piece, I'm gonna go back down so I get the number correctly, uh, 13 um, gives the board some uh, certainly, or excuse me, the committee some insight. I think the board has a has a stake in that as well, the trustee boards. And uh, in administration, we have um, appeals on benefits. Uh, we have, uh, you know, I, I um, uh, uh, appeals when something wasn't timely submitted, things along that line. That's not um, what I think the investment committee should focus on. The investment committee should focus entirely on the issues of um, of, um, of uh, performance within acceptable risk and getting to point 13. And I think that uh, I was very impressed. We, you know, we recently went with RVK and if you listen to uh, Jim Voico's testimony uh, yesterday, you know why uh, he does a great job and you see that we do build those in, um, but we build those in with the guide toward um, uh, how it impacts performance. And I think that there are two very distinct functions and uh, I would prefer to see the investment committee. And I think that, um, members would that uh, they concentrate on on the job that they're supposed to do maximize return 
Um, one more question, Madam Chair, and then I promise to go away. Um, Madam Treasury, did I hear you right? Is there any component to these pensions that there's a disability insurance or component to it? Uh, yes, and they vary by plan. Um, I, Erica uh, Wolfing, who's our um, Director of Retirement Operations, can um, uh, give you more detail on that. Um, but yes, there is a disability um, uh, uh, provision in e each of the plans. And when we're looking at disability, um, it goes to a medical review board first um, to, um, uh, to make a determination, and then the boards will vote. Um, it might be a one-year review, or it might be that the individual is permanently dis disabled, uh, and we, we, uh, the board does make determinations um, or recommendations on that. The medical review board does, and then the boards act on that. A few years ago, we added some, um, some uh, language around that uh, representative to tighten that up so that we would do income verifications uh, for folks that um, um, are in the um, up to normal retirement, up to the re age that they re um, meet normal retirement, to do a verification on, um, on outside income. And uh, that is reported to, um, to, uh, to our office. And if we think there's a need to go back and take a look um, at, um, at the um, disability um, uh, um, um, current disability status, we, we will, and we would also adjust the pension accordingly if there's an um, uh, uh, outside income that, um, that's outside of a formula, and I'm going to have to have Erica uh, uh, come in and give you that. But uh, So we strengthened the disability maybe about uh, five years ago. Um, I, I'm doing that uh, best estimate. Time kind of compresses, as you know, um, in, in this cycle, uh, Representative, um, and it does for all of us. But um, uh, there is there is a disability benefit for our members. Uh, thank you, Madam Treasurer. Tom Galanka, did you have any um, thoughts on either of those issues? Well, the only uh, I know Representative proposal in there that talks about the VPIC assuming responsibility over setting the annual um, assumed rate of return as well as inflation targets and the smoothing methodology. So in regards to the actuaries, those would be the three uh, uh, functions that we think VPIC could perform and could perform well. But that's uh, that was the only aspect of this proposal that included uh, benefit side to some extent. So I would just comment on that. Thank you. John Gannon. Thank you, Madam Chair, and, and thank you, um, Beth and Tom, for, for presenting the, this um, governance um, recommendation uh, to the committee. Um, it's very detailed. I, I really appreciate the definition of um, financial um, expert, um, but I just have a couple of questions. Um, they're minor questions. I, I note that you say all board members must be Vermont residents. Could, could you just explain that, please? I think that uh, occasionally we have uh, folks that have retired and moved out of state, and uh, um, um, that's okay. By the way, 78% um, uh, these numbers might be a couple years old 78% of state employees, when they retire, um, uh, stay in Vermont. Um, pay taxes in Vermont um, and, um, and participate in their communities and about 75% of teachers. Obviously, Florida is the next one that people might go to and uh, New Hampshire. And some of, some of those folks, actually, I have one person in my office that lives in New Hampshire and I presume he's not going to move to Vermont to retire. But um, I think that um, uh, having a, a part of that community is important and uh, and uh, uh, in my perspective, it's it's great to have those folks, but they're more in tune to what's happening in Vermont and the uh, the economic issues that are happening in Vermont. Uh, that uh, if they're here, and that that's not a disrespect. We had a member um, from Florida um, that um, uh, he was exceptional. He gave his life. He was a uh, uh, lifelong uh, dedication to um, to um, um, uh, the benefit of teachers and investments. And uh, I I I. Um, uh, he passed away several years ago, and um, uh, uh, I, I would just say I miss Jay terribly. But uh, he added value to the um, to the. But I think that from a from a um, administrative side um, and a um, um, and uh, a um, a sense of Vermont that it makes uh, sense to have uh, individuals um, reside in in the state. And Representative, again, I'd probably add to that in regards to. You know, there is a connection to the appointing body and the board and somewhat of feedback, particularly when you go to the, the Veeamer side or the uh, 
the teacher side or the employees or the employee, the state employee side, it's good to have that connection maintained. And it's good to have a, a feedback relationship if you're going to maintain this multiple board model. Um, you know, I don't think it's a problem right away when people move out of state. I think it becomes a problem as time goes on, as that, that distance between the board or the state sort of goes away. Um, there also is an addition, uh, additional concern we've struggled with over the years in regards to reimbursement of expenses for members to participate. Now, obviously, with the aim of age, age of Zoom, it's a lot easier and we have no more flexibility, but that has been a concern. You know, how much uh, you know, should we have, should we pay people to 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 come back to these meetings or, or what what should we uh, invest in that in regards to uh, equipment if we have to equip a board member that's out of state? So. Yeah. I don't think it's an immediate problem, but it's something to consider. And uh, I threw it on the table as sort of an idea that, uh, you know, I'm not wedded to it. You know, obviously it's, it's something that would be uh, something to consider. Thank, thanks for that explanation. And I just have one other question, which is um, in 11, you talk about what VPIC should do and you talk about smoothing method um, used for the calculation of actuarial valuation of assets. I think, Tom, I spoke with you privately about that. Um, mm -hmm. But it might be good for the committee to to get an explanation of what that means and why it's important. Well, I come from the investment world, so I don't I don't live in the actuarial world of smoothing, and so, and and Beth would probably disagree with me that it makes it easier for reporting. But from my perspective, smoothing can hide errors or hide things until it maybe is too late for you to make proper corrective actions. And so from a, from a management perspective or from a review perspective, which I think this body needs to do, um, whether or not you use a five-year smoothing or a three-year smoothing, maybe the smoothing should be three years instead of five years to correspond to the actuarial study, but it hides some of the current performance. Now you can look at that in different ways. It, it would prevent us from changing the rates of return too soon, but it also gets into a situ situation like we are here, where some of these issues that you're bringing up in the committee, we brought up in investments two or three years ago and have since made changes to. Whereas if you could align timing wise from um, the investment decisions to your oversight responsibility would be very helpful. So I think that's why I view it. You know, I live in a mark to market world. And so looking at things on how they are currently to me is more important. If I could comment on that, and it's a great uh, example of discourse and collaborative uh, discussion because I'm looking at it more from a, um, uh, an actuarial and a budgetary side. Uh, I, um, I know that you folks, when you get a budget, you know, we, we do debt service, for instance, and one year we might have, you know, a debt service payment that falls into the next year. So you say, oh, good, I've got less money I need to put into the debt service. And then the next year you've got uh, uh, a little more because of that timing and you say, what happened? Okay, and, uh, and that creates um, issues with the base budget. Smoothing helps with that. And uh, this is something that, um, um, is helpful in terms of the budgetary process, uh, number one, so that uh, you're not having wild ups and downs in terms of, uh, of, um, of uh, your, um, uh, at least the investment component. Now, I will grant you, we still have had wild ups and downs, and that's a lot to do with, um, again, in particular, the teacher system, the demographics. But uh, I think that that's, that's one side of it. The other is uh, taking a look at losses and how you react to that. And great, the Great Recession, um, uh, you know, you took a look at it and you had that, uh, I don't know whether it was 30%, but a, a pretty precipitous uh, drop. And that was smoothed over time uh, so that uh, uh, you, you, that was a one-time event, or at least we hope so. I'm going to knock on wood as I say that. Um, but, um, um, and you don't want to have um, um, uh, major changes to, um, to, to reflect that one-time event. You want to be able to smooth it over time and make uh, decisions uh, that um, um, take a look at the long-term view. Now, I will tell you during the Great Recession, some folks trying to balance out and say, we're going to, you know, um, that this is going to increase our, um, our, uh, um, our ADEC or ARC back then, actuarially, uh, actuarially determined employer contribution. So I know some states that said, that's pushing out 10 years. OK, and uh, and when the boom market came after that, they said, well, maybe we shouldn't have done it for 10 years because now we're not reaping those benefits. So uh, we can have a discussion of what's the, the correct way. But I think it helps um, with ups and downs and um, in, in very, um, uh, very um, the black swan swan type of events um, or um, uh, and in terms of budgeting. 
Uh, I would also point that there's a 20% corridor on both sides. So if you're outside of the, um, of the corridor, um, it's presumed that that, um, that, that change is, is permanent. And so that portion would not um, be included um, in that smoothing piece. Thank you. Peter Anthony. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, and thank you, uh, Mr. Galanka and uh, Treasurer Pierce. Uh, I have three areas uh, that I'm curious uh, to inquire about. <clears throat> they cover several bullets. The three areas involve continuity, independence, and balance. Uh, first, on the continuity side, do I understand that Mr. Uh, Dumas and Mr. Davis and Mr. Galanka will uh, transfer et al, whoever else is on the uh, uh, boards to the new structure, at least until their terms are up. Well, um, well Roger's on the other underlying board. He's not on VPIC. So this would only affect the VPIC members. So- Only the VPIC members. Yeah, okay. I didn't really go into structure or recommendations on the, that, that's the okay. underlying I just, board. I just wanted to, to be assured uh, about the continuity feature. The continuity feature was intended to be, is, yeah, just the VPIC members. Yeah, okay, cool. Um, my next inquiry has to do with independence. <clears throat> As I'm sure you're aware, um, conceptually, independence and accountability can, um, um, how shall I say, create a tension uh, as between them. Um, what's your meaning? What, And I guess this is directed to uh, Treasure Pierce, actually, what do you, independent from whom, independence for what, uh, and how does that square with what we, what we, I think we've learned about the um, necessity of ongoing check-ins and accountability? Thank you. So I think independence from politics is one of the uh, the big pieces to this uh, in terms of um, its structure and membership. I think that, again, there should be skin in the game uh, for uh, for employees and, and bringing that perspective. But I think the structure, as we have, provides um, a, a, a much more uh, uh, a political approach to it. Now, I'm a member of the committee, and I should be a member of the committee. I think that that's important because the treasurer's office has a great deal of interaction with it. Um, but you and right now, again, I have uh, one six of the votes or if, um, if there's a tie one seventh of the votes um, as, as we um, we move forward, but the staff do um, uh, uh, report in our office, uh, although I will tell you that when we do the hiring, we bring Tom in, uh, we don't do this in absence of the of the chair. So. I think that the board as a whole should have um, some more input in, in, in the hiring of the, um, excuse me, the hiring of the CIO uh, and uh, uh, that's part of it. Now, um, I think you've been fortunate uh, for the last three treasurers, uh, uh, then Treasurer Douglas, uh, 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 then Treasurer Spalding and myself, that we have some financial background we have and, and we've taken a very measured approach, you know, in terms of bringing politics into the office. That may not be there in the future. Um, you know, I'm not going to um, uh, comment on electoral politics and what, what could happen. Uh, but you want to be able to create um, some independence uh, fr from our office in terms of uh, its potential influence on the staff in the decision making that, and recommendations that the staff have. So I think that that's a good way to go. I think that, again, when I look back, um, I'm grateful. Um, for the work that um, um, uh, both, as I said, then Treasurer Douglas and Treasurer Spalding provided to our office. Uh, uh, I came into a situation where uh, uh, the basics were done, uh, there were good ideas, and we were able to build on those. And we want treasurers that continue to do that. But in an election process, and that gets, by the way, back to appointment or election of treasurers, I'm not going to go down that road. Um, but um, I think that uh, this provides some, some separation uh, from the staff being influenced by the um, uh, the elected uh, officials uh, potentially in our office or in other departments that work very closely with them. Thank you. My third subject area is balance. Um, I think I'm hearing that you and I may differ in terms of uh, the meaning of balance in this. I was thinking of the um, relative perspectives between employer and employee. But if I'm counting correctly, there are uh, at least uh, one additional employer um, 
person on the board than employee. Am I uh, off off uh, the mark or, okay. well, or is me, it just a, a nomenclature issue? Okay. I think it may be a nomenclature issue. So they have three retirement board um, members that are employees. And, uh, and again, I think that's important. Then you have three um, employer representatives. Uh, one is the, the commissioner of finance representing the state system. Uh, and uh, the second and third would be from the Vermont um, League of Cities and Towns and the, um, uh, the, um, uh, uh, the school board association or another entity. I'm not, uh, 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 the organizational structure out there is not something that, um, um, is uh, in my bailiwick, so there's certainly room for discussion. So you have three employer members. So I think you have balance there. And then you have three experts, two of which are, are um, appointed by the governor and the third one um, by the committee as a whole. Okay, I'm worried, I guess, about the two gubernator gubernatorial appointees. And uh, you'll pardon me, but being a treasurer, I think you're more employee than employer, or sorry, employer rather than employee. Um, but maybe it's a nomenclature issue. Again, yeah. I just know that the um, yeah. uh, it came up early, even this morning that the appearance of imbalance is is something that that weighs very heavily on people who want to go at this with goodwill and uh, trust mm -hmm. and good yeah. intentions. Um, well, we, we, we took a rudimentary approach to it, and obviously, it's your prerogative to make changes to this. It was the idea of employee employer and then public members to some extent representing taxpayers. And it was that sort of balance of those three entities. And, and so we're not wedded exactly to this obviously, but it was that idea that any proposal that you guys put together finally should have some element of balance and it shouldn't be much more than this in terms of size. Um, I, will, I, appreciate I, do answer, I do want to answer one of your questions in regard to independence, because how do yeah. I define independence? And and I define independence in, in, in a sense, how we're kind of working with Beth's office right now and just expand on that and maybe um, uh, formalize that relationship. Because Beth has given us a lot of autonomy as a committee to kind of work ideas and, and build s systems into place. Um, I could see us uh, having more budgetary authority, but I, I always envision a key relationship with the treasurer's office if only through an MOU or some type of interrelationship and, and getting to your reporting relationship, all of these reporting relationships I would envision would maintain and would report to this committee because it is a state entity. So, so I, I, we say independence, but I think it's more defining what we do right now in my mind. Thank you very much, Tom. Other questions from committee members. Great. So, um, I wanted to go back for a moment to Eric Henry um, with respect to the consultant and the, the process and timeline there. So share with us what, what work you've done on that. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, again, Eric Henry, uh, for the record, Chief Investment Officer. In terms of the governance study, we have uh, released a request for proposals to four firms with expertise in this space. Responses are due two weeks from Monday, so we should have a pretty good idea of, of what the scope of, of such a review might be within a week. And Madam Chair, if I may, just with regard to independence and autonomy, uh, there's been a lot of discussion about what that means and, and how things would change. As I view it, this is really just a codification of what's already happening. Uh, the Treasury has given us great autonomy to work closely with the committee and the chairman, and, and we're doing that regularly. There's a lot of constructive debate among myself, the chairman, uh, and the treasurer and the committee members regularly. Uh, so it's not as if this isn't happening currently. Our concern, as, as the treasurer expressed, is really what might happen under a future treasurer. Appreciate that. Um, any other questions from committee members? Rob LeClaire. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Eric. Yesterday, and I think it was you, um, I swear I heard the comment that somebody said that the teacher's pension fund is, I forget what the term they use, but is spending roughly 13 to 16 million a month more out in benefits than it's taking in. And, and was it you? And if it wasn't you, I apologize. 
That is correct. We redeem approximately 13 million a month from the teacher plan to pay benefits. As you think about public sector DB plans, you might say the teacher plan is a more mature plan than the muni plan, which has more actives to the retirees. In the teacher plan, uh, the incoming contributions do not cover the outgoing payroll, so we do redeem uh, from month to month. Now, there is a big cash infusion that comes into that plan once a year that I'm sure the treasurer uh, could, could talk more about it if there are specifics on it. I, I believe that number is around 100 million a year. Uh, but on a month to month basis, it's important that we have sufficient liquid assets on hand to meet those, uh, the, the retiree payment obligations. Uh, so kind of in layman's terms, does that mean that we're basically taking about 13 million of principal out at least during the course of the year until you get that large, large cash infusion potentially? Correct. Okay. Thank you, sir. Tanya Vihovsky. That answered my question. Representative LeClaire read my mind. Well, on that note, maybe we should just be done for the day then. <laughs> <laughs> now you read my mind. <laughs> All right. Um, any other questions from committee members on this, uh, this joint proposal? Bob Hooper. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. I'd like to follow up with Eric just to make sure that there's a fine point on this 13 million. We're talking about actually liquidating holdings, not in the context of a rebalancing or anything else. This is a directed, we need cash to pay benefits, or is there some other part of the process that's going on? We do actually use this process to rebalance throughout the year. Uh, when we are raising uh, cash to pay these retirement benefits, we look to areas of the asset allocation that are over target. So for example, if equities have outperformed uh, the fixed income component of our portfolio and are over their target, we'll redeem that 13 million from the part of the portfolio that is overvalued. That really disciplines us to sell high and buy low as most investors want to do. Uh, there is a more formal rebalancing process that happens twice a year to the extent those benefit redemptions do not cover it. Um, but this is a, it, essentially it's a term, it's a, it's a form of uh, rebalancing throughout the year on a monthly basis. So in the context of the example that was given, uh, we're not so cash short that we have to be liquidating investments specifically for this purpose. We're basically liquidating investments because we have reached the peak of the recommended allocation for that particular sleeve of investment and then redirecting that to another cash need. We are actually uh, redeeming assets specifically for this purpose. So each month, uh, the middle of the month, we'll get a, a, an email from the cash manager indicating how much in cash he'll need to cover the annuity payroll. We then look to the asset allocation and look the parts of it where we're over and we'll specifically redeem that amount to cover those annuity payroll obligations. The key to this process is making sure that we don't have to sell assets that have that are discounted based on some sort of economic dislocation. Uh, as an example, we have a, a downturn hedge that consists of high quality core bonds. Uh, during the drawdown last March, when equities had sold off deeply, we were able to redeem from this bond allocation without suffering, incurring any short-term losses along the way. But to your point, Bob, they are, we are actually redeeming to meet these payroll obligations and capital calls as private equity funds are calling capital. But on the teacher fund, uh, there's a consistent 11 months out of the year, we're raising approximately $13 million to cover these benefit payments. Again, in the 12th month, there's a cash infusion that I believe is around 100 million that somewhat replenishes the fund and covers that month's annuity payroll. Madam Chair, if I could, that infusion is in fact the ADEC, the actually determined employer contribution. Once it's appropriated, uh, we put it right in there. Um, there used to be a past practice to hold it and do it quarterly. And frankly, if you're getting 8% uh, or 7% in the, um, in the uh, pension fund and you're getting Two or three percent in the um, in the place you're holding it. That's not uh, that's not a good idea. So we we put it in right at the front. And I would also point out that assets continue to grow. This isn't where you're taking the money out and um, and uh, being in a position where 
um, uh, uh, your assets are declining. They will decline um, as they did during the Great Recession. And getting to uh, Eric's point about liquidity in Tom's, there's been a great deal of effort to make sure that we always have sufficient liquidity in a, um, a um, um, potential adverse environment. Uh, we, um, we, did a, we do a very good job on that. We do a, an analysis to make sure that we, we uh, in terms of uh, stress to those in, in scenarios that we, uh, we have sufficient assets. Uh, not everyone has done that in the Great Recession. I think uh, Jim pointed that out yesterday. Uh, a number of very smart folks um, put too much money into um, um, to private equity and other illiquid assets, and we're in a real crunch in 2008 to be able to, to uh, pay those benefits. And uh, I, I would say it's not unusual to have some uh, amount of cash um, being used to pay benefits. That's that's kind of the idea that over time, uh, you're you're not um, putting in the uh, the full amount of uh, of, um, of payments on a pay go basis that you're using investments to do it. But I think that the teacher system, in particular, with its funding status and the demographics of it, um, um, have a much more um, severe uh, cash flow, but are still growing assets. And I think that's important to understand. Tom. I'd just add that this highlights the importance of funding the ADAC, because if we didn't have that $100 million, think of the outflow that would be occurring, and it would just accelerate the problem that we already have. Um, you know, you look at the payout ratio of what percentage of assets you can sell, you can, like an endowment, for example, I know this is different from endowment, but once you get over four, four and a half percent of distribution out of a portfolio, it, it gets really difficult to grow it long term. And so... Yeah. If you were having 130, 150 million in outflow each year on a trust that's worth a billion and a half, two billion, you're looking at close to 10%. And that's where it gets really problematic. So the ADEC is helping, but it's also, if it had been funded, you would have had appreciation from, so it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a problem. And that, that, this highlights the need for fully funding it and actually adding more because you get into this leverage issue of distributing money out of the trust. So I, I, I see the issue and we've been growing out of it, but what happens in a year you don't grow out of it and, and how does it further exacerbate the problem? Madam Chair, if I could follow up on that, that's the issue that we're having in terms of sustainability. Uh, the ADEC uh, is growing uh, uh, to, to meet this and does it grow to a point that you can no longer uh, make those appropriations? As I uh, said uh, in previous testimony, when you get out to 2037, we're gonna be talking about a, 50, a half billion dollar ADEC between the two systems. And the ability to, to sustain uh, that level of contribution is clearly going to have an impact on the cash flows and clearly going to have an impact on the, um, uh, the long-term viability of the fund. Uh, so I think that that's an important consideration. That's why you develop an ADEC. That's why you fund it. And folks that haven't funded in the past, um, I won't mention the states, are in a much more serious um, 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 uh, uh, condition. Uh, that said, um, I, I'm concerned about the sustainability of the ADEC that we currently have. And that's one of the reasons we need to take a look at, uh, frankly, the benefit structure. Peter Anthony. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. The reason I was being so picky, and, and I think uh, my colleague from Barrytown uh, also wanted to be clear on this, uh, was because the ADEC does not discriminate between uh, the teachers and the state employees in terms of um, uh, where the, the need for liquidity, the need for uh, new funds are. And yet I think we sense, I sense, uh, that if you're going to do some adjustments either on the benefit or the contribution side, you really want to know uh, as between the two broadly um, groups uh, where the cash flow squeeze is. And you very rightly said it's usually or has been on the teacher's side. But the ADEC, of course, is not divided between the two. And in consequence, any asset liquidation is not divided between the two. But for us who want to feel good about saying we have to adjust one side or the other, the income or the outcome, it's important to know which group we're talking about. And that's why I was being picky. Thanks. 
Madam Chair, if I could respond, and I think either Tom or Eric would follow up on it. Um, th there is a separate ADAC for each system, the state and the teacher's system. Um, and when we're looking at rebalancing, uh, so when uh, we're, we're um, on a monthly basis and in those uh, twice a year, uh, we're doing that by system. So while they're, they are pooled assets, they have separate accounting. Um, and uh, uh, so they're not, um, well, they're, sh they're sharing for the purposes of risk pooling and get a better return, lower cost. Uh, and uh, the first year you switch to the pool environment um, back in 2005, the fees went down by a million dollars, uh, which that's back in 2005. I would suggest it's um, uh, more of an economy of scale now. But that rebalancing and the process of, um, monthly of accounting, there's a separate integrity for each, each of the funds. Absolutely correct. Uh, while we have a one pool of $5.4 billion, uh, that pool is allocated to each of the three plans. When we're raising funds in the teacher plan, that only impacts assets devoted to the teacher plan. So there's and no I'll add that. Yeah, and I'll note, note that you'll you will see minor deviations between the plan and investment return. It's 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 negligible, but it's because of that very question and cash flow rebalancing. Bob Hooper. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Two things. One, before we go off YouTube at the end of this testimony. I would like a moment for a comment. And two, uh, at the beginning of the meeting, uh, you both said you're here not as representatives of VPIC, but as individuals, quote unquote. Should we expect a comment from the actual board at some point in time or? Uh, I'd be happy to call a VPIC meeting at any time once we have a proposal. Um, I think VPIC would love to make a comment on whatever proposal uh, GovOps presents in regards to their future and how it impacts them. I think that would be appropriate. Um, I, I guess the only proposal on the table right now is the one that came out that eliminates VPIC. And so I, I, I feel it's important for at least to, to make some comments of how that would affect the state and, and how that would impact, you know, what you should be thinking about if you're replacing VPIC. So a goodbye party is appropriate then. <laughs> yes. Rob LeClaire. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. I'm not sure if this is a question for Eric or, or the Treasurer, but it, it's my understanding that the state has made all the ADAC payments from 2007, 2008. In fact, in many instances, it's exceeded the ADAC payments. But if we don't have some sort of a systemic change on the benefit side, what would those ADAC payments have to look like in today's trajectory? Uh, I think that I'd like to take the first shot at that. Um, so um, the um, uh, the ADAC we have been funding that uh, since two thousand and seven for the uh, for the state system, uh, teacher system and and funding it. Um, uh, um, a more robust funding history for the state system, which is why going into the Great Recession, uh, the state system was 100.8%, not 108, but 100.8% funded. It was fully funded. Um, and the uh, teachers was in the, um, in the low to mid 80s. And as a consequence, going into the Great Recession, when you take a look at that, um, the teacher system obviously took a bigger hit. So there was significant underfunding of the teacher system. And in 2017, I worked with the actuary to say, how much is that costing in terms of the ADEC now? And that's roughly $25 million on the amortization schedule. You know, while it wasn't part of the 604 million because that, um, um, you know, we've been funding the ADEC, it is a contributing factor in how much uh, of, the, um, of the ADEC we're funding now. Um, there was another piece of underfunding, which was the teacher system. And I, I testified to this earlier. We um, uh, we pay health care for the teacher system out of the um, out of the um, uh, a sub fund within the pension plan. And that's fine if you fully fund it, but they did not. So uh, uh, with all due respect, the General Assembly did not and neither did the governor include it um, um, in his budget up to 2014. We made the change, I believe, effective 2015. So, for instance, in 12, um, the uh, the dollars that uh, were required to pay the PAYGO 
uh, were um, $24 million roughly. And um, the legislature appropriated 4 million. So the 20 million ended up being added um, to a, a loss to the system and then uh, essentially paid off over the remaining mortgage period. Uh, so that contributed to, again, um, um, a, um, a decline in the, um, in the um, unfunded position uh, a, or increase in the unfunded position uh, for the teacher's system. And I remember looking at this and I thought it was about a one and a quarter or one and a half um, um, percent impact uh, year to year on the, um, on the, uh, on, on, on the increase in unfunded liability. We've corrected that, but we're still bearing that in terms of the mortgage because you put that, when you didn't pay it, then you've added it. So it's, if you think of the pension as a mortgage, this is, a, this is on top of it, a home equity loan that you're, that you're not paying back and uh, adding it from year to year. And if you look at that 20 million in 2012, it cost the taxpayers just under 60 million. You do it the next year, you do it the next year. So fixing that in 2015 was important but it added to the, uh, to the strain on the system and continues to do it with respect to its, its uh, cash position um, or a portion of the, uh, of, of the ADEC. Um, it was not part of the, the $604 million of, um, of um, unfunded liability um, increase because those are related to other factors. Um, although if you take a look at one of the charts I had, um, it was, uh, from 2011 to 2020, it was um, uh, someplace in the area of about $100 million of the impact during that period, uh, the, the continuation of the health care. I don't know, again, I tend to get in the weeds, sir, and I apologize. Um, if, if I've done that again, um, it, uh, please uh, help me out and ask another question. Very thorough as always, Madam Treasurer. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Any remaining questions from committee members? All right. Well, thank you to Tom Galanka, Eric Henry, and Treasurer Pierce. We appreciate your time. Um, this is uh, a, a, a very hopeful sign, I think, uh, a good next step in the discussion about pension governance in the state of Vermont. So I appreciate the time that you put into bringing this to us. Thank, thank you. you for, thank you very much for having us. And we're always uh, welcome to provide any support you need. Thank you. We'll have you in on again on another day. <laughs> Looking forward to it. Yep. Take care. Okay. Um, Bob Hooper. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and members of the public viewing. Uh, it's been brought to my attention that during our festivities about the Three Amigos presentation that uh, the comment about the film being in black and white, I then said something about brown and meaning that it was filmed in Mexico in the desert and being a photographer, that was important. And apparently it has been interpreted as looking at people of color which I sincerely apologize to those people that have interpreted it that way. I meant no offense, and uh, I hope that uh, none is taken. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. So committee, um, I think we will uh, call it a day and uh, come back into committee tomorrow morning after the floor uh, for some committee discussion and some planning of next steps. Any questions? I wish that I had played an April Fool's joke today, but I just didn't quite have the, didn't quite have the uh, energy to do that. Something in the back of my head says that listening to that $13 million story over and over again tonight will be that. <laughs> could be all right um have a good afternoon um i hope you don't have too much snow to shovel <laughs>